share a few announcements. Hope you have the bulletin. And um, some of you, I'm sure, said, no, I don't need a bulletin because I have the what? The app. Some of you have the app. So you can look at the bulletin there. Um, there's a connection card, and you can fill out the connection card on your app, but also the paper copy there if there's some things you want to sign up for or you have a prayer request. We take that seriously, and we encourage you to just communicate with us. So, once Christmas is all done and we start 2018, we've been telling you about this for a while, we're starting the journey. And we are going to, as a church family, be reading all through the New Testament, the Old Testament, and uh, encouraging one another to obey and worship Jesus in Scripture as we read it. So I just want to encourage you, if you're planning to do the journey with us, I would really love to know that so that I can stay in touch with you and encourage you. So uh, on the connection card, you'll notice on the back, it just says, I'm going to do the journey. You can, you can mark that and put your name and put that in the offering box. You can do the same thing through the app. And so I've been asking a lot of people, if you're doing the journey, and they're saying yes, and I say, have you let me know? And they said no. And so here's your chance. Please let us know. You can also just email the church office or email me. And let me know you're planning a journey with us. That would be great. One thing you should know about the journey, um, you can obviously just read out of uh, Scripture, and there's a, a schedule in the foyer you can pick up. It's also on our app, or you can download the Read Scripture app, which has some videos embedded in that. And then every Sunday night, myself and a few others are going to be down at the Grind. It's a coffee shop downtown. And we're going to be reading all of that week's Scripture. That's because no doubt all of us at some point in 2018 will get a bit behind, and this will allow us to get caught up, and then we'll also spend some time, if you want to stay, just to read or to talk about the scripture that we read. So keep that in mind as well. So you noticed when you came in, I'm sure that there's these nice-looking candle holder things. Aren't those awesome? If you look really close at those, those are very skillfully made, and uh, I don't want to embarrass Jesse, but I'm going to probably a little bit. Jesse Cox um, is amazingly skilled at that sort of thing. You know, he's the one that made the, all this stuff up here in the cross, and he made these because Lindsay said, hey, I want to have more candles on Christmas Eve, so we asked Jesse, and Dad pushed Jesse a little bit, I think, and Jesse... Jesse, thank you very much. We appreciate that. <laughs> Job well done. I might even say, Jesse, you worshiped Jesus when you did these. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this is the fourth Sunday of Advent. We've had the, the candle of hope, the candle of humility, the candle of obedience, the candle of worship today. When Jesus came into the world, he changed everything, and one, somebody once said he changed rebels into worshipers, and he did that one person at a time, and we're here today, most of us, maybe all of us, because God has done that in us, and our theme for Advent this year is that Christmas continues to change the world as Jesus continues to do these things through us. As Jesus continues to make us people of hope in a world that when you watch the news that looks hopeless in many different ways, we can be and should be people of hope. Amen? We look for what is Scripture calls the blessed hope when Jesus is going to come again. But hey, let's not wait until then to be hopeful, right? Because Jesus can show up anytime, right? In all kinds of different ways in our lives showing himself to us. We should be people of hope. We should be people of humility, having the same example or following the example that Jesus gave for us who considered others as more important than himself. Can you imagine a church where people always considered other people more important? Can you imagine a community like that? Can you imagine a world like that? It would be beautiful. And we can do that as Jesus works in us being people of obedience. Masami talked about that last week. Being willing to obey no matter what the cost. That's what Jesus did. Understanding that even though there's a cost, there's a great blessing 
in obedience. Today we focus on being people of worship. But here's a challenge for us as we think about that. What does it mean to be people of worship? What does it mean to worship? Have any of us worshipped this morning here? Maybe, maybe not. It's a challenge to come up with a definition of worship. And what's really interesting about that is this concept of worship, this, even this word in English that is worship, is seen in Scripture over 9,000 times. And you would think that somewhere in those, God would just say, here's exactly what worship is so we could all get it right. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. So maybe the first thing we need to learn this morning is that worship can't be narrow and small and in a box. That it's huge and it's massive and it is indeed 24-7. So one of the things I did this week is, is I looked at all the Hebrew words that are our English Bible or translated worship. Then I looked at all the Greek words and there's many of them and I found that very interesting. And then one of the scholars, he's a Greek scholar, and all of us who want to know a little bit more about Greek, we always read what W.E. Vine says about the Greek. Here's what he says at the end of his exposition on all the Greek words that mean worship. The worship of God is nowhere defined in Scripture. A consideration of the above verge shows that it's not confined to praise, Broadly, it may be regarded as the direct acknowledgement to God of his nature, of his attributes, of his ways and claims, whether by the outgoing of heart in praise and thanksgiving or by deed done in such acknowledgement. So here's what he's saying. It can't be narrowed down to one specific thing. All the Greek words have a little different nuance. All the Hebrew words have a little different nuance when it comes to worship. It's very, very broad. It's about God. It's directed to God, but in many, many different ways. So what I'd like to do today is look at all 9,000 of those places in Scripture. Well, let's not do that. Let's just look at one place in Scripture, just one that mentions worship, and see if we can... Look at some principles, not narrowing it down, but opening it up so it's broad and big. And, and it's a familiar passage, actually, in our study of Matthew. We've looked at it already. It's Matthew chapter 2. It's about the Magi. Here's what it says. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to what? Worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Moving on to verse 7. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I may too come and worship him. Moving on to verse 11. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod the Magi, left for their own country by another way. Let's pray. Father, please help us understand more fully how we can worship you and Jesus, how we can honor you in our lives. I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us today, Lord, each one of us individually so we might leave this place, Jesus, being better worshipers. Can you say amen to that? So you noticed in that text that the idea of worship, the actual word worship was used three different times and We've already talked about the context of this scripture. It was not right at the birth of Jesus. It was sometime later because the Magi came to a house, not a manger. And we talked a little bit before about who these Magi were. They were from the Persia area, which is uh, Iraq on the map today. 
They were the kingmakers of their day. They were well-educated. They were influential. And I want us to look at this and say, wow, worship is huge, even as we look at this one text. Here's the first thing we see, that it was intentional. They traveled a long time over some harsh roads or trails to do something very specific, and that was to worship Jesus. The trip began and ended with an intentional purpose. They saw something in the sky. They were able to connect that with the Hebrew scripture that they had in the providence of God. And they said, this one that scripture points to, this one that the sky directs us to, is worthy of our worship. And so they went to worship this king. Now, certainly they didn't understand all about him. I mean, they understood little about him other than the Hebrew scriptures pointed to him and the sky and the providence of God directed them to him. So they didn't understand everything, but they knew that this one that they were traveling to see was worthy of worship. Now, verse 4 in our text mentions this was the Messiah, and so the Jewish people were always looking for the Messiah, and they understood that. So they knew that this wasn't just an earthly king, this was a messianic king, a spiritual king. Now it's interesting, king of the Jews. That title was actually given to Herod some 40 years earlier. So he for years had been called the king of the Jews, but he was never called the Messiah. So this one that the Magi came to worship was unique and different. I want you to notice they did not worship Herod. Many did. I want you to notice they didn't actually worship the stars or the skies or the objects in the heavens, which many did. At this point in their life, Scripture records for us they intentionally worshiped who? Jesus. It was all about this Jesus that Scripture told them about. You know, every culture has its own unique objects of worship. In many cultures, even today, kings are worshipped. For many people, creation is worshipped. Some people worship power. Some people worship money. Why do people worship at all? I think Solomon answers that in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a unique phrase in Ecclesiastes 3 that says, God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. That means we're looking for something always because there's this, this eternal thing within us. We're looking for something or somebody to worship. And it's been said that everybody worships something. Do you agree with that? I think indeed. As human beings, we are made to worship. Now, I don't know the history necessarily in details of all these magi about what they worshipped or who they worshipped before. We don't know that. But what we know from Scripture is they came intentionally to worship who? Jesus. I want you to get that. It was a very focused worship on this Jesus. And if we go all the way to the end of the story in the book of Revelation, which is right before the maps, if you go there, you're going to see worship mentioned 24 times. But I want you to notice that it's not a vague worship of something spiritual. It's not a nebulous worship of the divine. It's not even a general worship of, quote, God. Who's it the worship of? Jesus. He's the one that is intentionally bowed down before. He's the one that is holy, holy, holy. So here's my question for you. Did you come today to worship Jesus? Or did you come for something much less than that? Something more vague than that? Did you come out of religious duty you will leave unsatisfied because religious duty is never satisfactory. Did you come out of obligation? Well, you can check off the box, but 
that won't be satisfying. Did you come out of tradition? Traditions are good, but traditions can become very dead and stagnant. But if you came to worship Jesus, you'll be satisfied. I want you to notice also that the worship these magi was submissive. What did they do? It says they fell to the ground and worshiped him. I don't know if submissive is the right word. I don't know the right word that captures falling to the ground. And and as I understand that, that actually means they were face down, laying in front of this child king. What I find interesting about that is both the primary Hebrew word for worship and the primary Greek word for worship mean just that, to lay prostrate before. Now understand, these were grown men. Not just grown men, but they were influential men. They were powerful men. They were well-educated men. They were wealthy men. They were men from where they came from who people would probably bow down to them. But here at this point, they submit themselves even physically to this child king. They saw this king as greater than them, more significant than them, more honorable than this king that is worthy of worship and submission. As I thought about that, I thought of many of the other world religions and cults. They take this biblical truth that we've been created in the image of God to a place that says, well, then we must be God. Yet when scripture says that we've been made in the image of God implies something quite different. That there is a creator and we are the created and the created can never be the creator. It just does just the opposite of what many cults do in making themselves God. God is greater. We are less. God is supreme. We are not. God is omnipotent. We are impotent in any sense you want to use that word. And many people never worship the true God because they think in their own minds, whether they would say it or not, that they are God. They are the attention. They are the one that they ought to be concerned about. And many people never worship Jesus because they can't imagine they have any need for this Jesus. I was reading this last week with one of our young men, this passage in John 4. It's a conversation that Jesus has with who we call the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. I encourage you to go back and read that and see how skillfully Jesus directs this woman to understand her need. That she needed this Jesus. That it was much more than physical water that she needed. It was spiritual living water. He directs her to the point that she finally says, I have this need. The Apostle Paul writes to his young friend Timothy and he boasts of this. Notice this boast. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into words to save came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. That's his boast. I'm the worst sinner. The Apostle Paul was a great worshiper of Jesus because he recognized he had a need, and he submitted to the only one who could meet that need. It was a sin issue. So I can say this, you really can't be a worshiper of Jesus unless you submit to Jesus. And find that he's the only one that can meet your needs. So this worship was intentional. It was submissive. And I also want you to notice this worship of Jesus was active. They didn't just bow down. What's it go on to say? That they opened their treasures and they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They gave this king what they had. Actually, what they'd been in the providence of God, been given. They were very wealthy. And so gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a precious metal. It's still precious today, very valuable. Frankincense was a valuable perfume, and myrrh was a very costly oil. 
And they represented something. I don't want to go into all the symbolic meanings. I just want you to understand this was valuable stuff. This was worth a lot of money. And these magi in the providence and plan of God had been given great wealth. So what did they do with their wealth? They gave it. It's something they'd been given and they said, well, we'll give what we've been given. Here's a question I have for you. It's a question the Apostle Paul asked the believers in Corinth when they were dealing with issues of pride. He asked this question. What do you have that you did not receive? Anybody want to answer that question? What do you have that you haven't received? What's the answer? Everybody get that? Nothing. Everything that we have in our life right now is something that's been granted to us in the providence and plan of God. Did you deserve it? Sir, not only not. And I would say not ever. So then to worship actively is to honor Jesus with all that we've been given. And what have we been given? Say it. Everything. You understand the dots that need to be connected here? So then everything in our life then can become something that we worship with and worship through. Think of this, our treasure, financial blessing, material blessing. We should give that as a way of worship because it's been given to us, amen? But also we should spend it as a way of worship. Not spent on things that don't honor Jesus. It should be spent on things that honor Jesus. And it should be invested in ways that honor Jesus. Everything that we have then can be used as worship of Jesus. Think of your time. Every breath that we have, every moment that we have is a gift from God so that every moment of our lives then can be acts of worship. Doing those things that honor Him. Think of our talents. All of us have things that we love to do, and those are usually the things that we do well by God's grace and providence. He's given us skills and abilities to do things well, and so we can worship God as we do those things very, very well to his glory. Some of you are great with numbers. You have an engineer or an accounting mind, then worship Jesus by doing that well. Amen? Some of you are artistic. You can paint or draw. Some of you are musical. That's a gift from God. So that gift and that ability should be used ultimately for the worship of Jesus and giving him the credit. Some of you have the gift of gab. I say gab to worship Jesus. Some of you, you do that so well, you just draw people to yourself because you can talk and you can interact and you can tell stories and that's because Jesus gave you that ability, so use that for him. Some of you are amazing athletes. So I say run and jump and slam dunk to worship Jesus. Many of you know the story of a man who was called the Flying Scotsman, Eric Little. He's a strong follower of Jesus, and uh, the movie Chariots of Fire was about his life. His parents were missionaries in China, and he was also intending to be a missionary in China, which what he ultimately did. But God gave him another gift. What was it? He was fast. He was fast. And he qualified for the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And there's a part in this movie, uh, we just kind of stumbled across this movie. It was on television not too long ago. And it was interesting. It was just at this scene when he's having a conversation with his sister, Jenny. Now, Jenny, so the movie portrays, I don't know how accurate this is, it kind of portrays that she didn't want him to run. So they have this conversation. He says, I've decided I'm going back to China. 
the missionary service has accepted me. His sister, thinking that she was convinced or had convinced him, says, Oh, Eric, I'm so pleased. But Eric continues. But I've got a lot of running to do first, Jenny. You've got to understand, I believe that God made me for a purpose, for China. But he goes on to say, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I love that line. Then he goes on to say, to give it up would be to hold him in contempt. You are right, it's not just fun. He says, to win is to honor him. So Eric worshipped Jesus by doing what? Running really fast. And he knew that that was a gift from God. I did a little more explanation, or exploring. How did Eric Little get this amazing view of life? He actually got it from his dad. His dad has been quoted in writing or saying this. I'll read it to you. You can praise God by peeling a spud if you peel it to perfection. Don't compromise. Compromise is a language of the devil. Run in God's name and let the world stand back and wonder. Parents, I want to encourage you. See what your children have been gifted by God to do well and then say, that's how you worship Jesus because you've been given that ability. Can you run fast and worship Jesus? Can you have fun excelling at basketball and worship Jesus? Can you peel a, uh, can, can you peel a spud and worship Jesus? And the answer is yes. Are you getting that? Yes. Worship is actively doing the things that God has created you well to do and excelling at it for his glory. I wish that truth would have sunk in for me earlier on in my life. I spent years in sports, basketball, baseball, football, and the older I get, the better I was. But during those years, I wish I'd understood that truth. Because in my mind, there was this separation, a, an unbiblical separation. Somehow I could, I, I, I could do sports. I love sports. There was a certain ability there. But I really should worship Jesus. Do you understand how wrong that is? That's just so unbiblical. And I wish I could have connected those dots earlier. So I want to encourage you parents, connect the dots for your children. Whatever God has gifted them to do well, help them understand they do it for Jesus, and it's a beautiful act of worship. Some of you love to cook, and you excel at it. I love you guys. <laughs> do that well for the glory of Jesus. Let me know when you're doing it. Last summer, we did this strange thing. We called it Worship Outside the Box, where we went out in the community and we did different things. And I got the sense that some of you didn't think we should do that. Well, because it wasn't in the church building, and it didn't involve preaching, and it didn't involve singing. And yes, preaching and singing and being in the church can be worship, but it's not the only thing we can do on Sunday morning that's worship. Amen? Lots of things can be done. It's interesting, the Magi did not break into a song after they gave the gifts. They didn't sing at all. How can you worship Jesus without singing? As a matter of fact, for some of you here today, worshiping Jesus through singing is a tough gig. It's a tough assignment. No matter how good our musicians are, no matter what the songs are, some of us couldn't sing ourselves out of a wet paper bag. We just couldn't. Now, I'm not saying you have to sing and sound good. It's just that some of us don't like to sing. Is that true for anybody? Yeah, some of you are very sheeplessly putting your head. You're just singing. It doesn't, doesn't really do much for you. 
And again, I'm not saying you have to sing good, but the point is some of us just don't enjoy singing. We feel awkward singing. And so everybody's going to come here and we're going to sing and worship Jesus. And I know some of you are saying, when's this over? (laughs) Thank God it's not the only way we worship Jesus. Amen? There are other ways we worship Jesus. And and yes, coming together corporately, the Bible does talk about corporate worship and how important it is that we gather. And and singing is just one of the things that we, we do. But let's dare not narrow it down to that. It's so much bigger. Because Jesus is so much bigger. Last point today. This worship of Jesus was obedient worship. Verse 12 says, And being warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. God said, don't go back that way. Now, Masami last week talked about costly worship or costly obedience. And I don't know if this was costly or not for them. Maybe God gave them a shortcut. (laughs) Maybe it was actually better when they went another way. But maybe again, maybe it was a lot longer when they had to be obedient. Here's what we do know, though, is God told them what to do, what not to do. And so this worship of this king was also about obedience, because ultimately it brought protection of the king. Here's what we need to understand. When we obey Jesus, when we we obey Jesus by by what he tells us in his word, we are declaring something very important to our world. We are declaring that Jesus knows what is best. We are declaring that Jesus loves me so much that he's given me guidance by which he can bless me. We make very powerful statements of worship about Jesus when we simply obey. Last week when I had the children up here and we talked about obedience, I tried to connect another word to obedience for them. Do you remember what it was? You guys all forgot. I bet the kids remembered. It was obedience and blessing. Obedience and blessing. Trying to help them understand, and we need to understand as well, that there's never a time when we would obey what Jesus communicates to us through his word that we wouldn't experience blessing. They always go together. Sometimes the blessing comes a bit later, which is sometimes frustrating to us. But there's always blessing. And frankly, there's always disappointment when we choose not to obey. Simple obedience is what Jesus desires of us. And it's a powerful form of worship. I read this week that somebody actually said that obedience is the highest form of worship. I don't know that I can make such an absolute statement, but I understand why that statement is made. Because here's what Jesus told his disciples in John 14. He says, if you love me, you will what? You'll obey. Love, worship, glorifying him. Jesus himself ties it into obedience. And then we have a passage in 1 Samuel 15, the story of Saul, who thought somehow offering sacrifices was more important than simply obeying. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. We misunderstand, even like Saul did, that somehow a two-hour sacrifice of time on Sunday morning is somehow more important than a week of just walking in obedience to the Lord. Now, I don't think I can absolutely say that obedience is the highest form of worship, but here what I, here's what I can certainly say absolutely, is that disobedience in our life is absolutely contrary and inconsistent with worship of Jesus. 
So maybe some of us today need to be like the Magi who need to leave for home another way. You've, you've been on this route, and it's a sinful route, and your, your intentions have not been good, and it's taking you further from the Lord. And maybe like the Magi, God's just saying, go back another way. Change direction. Choose to walk in obedience. And can I remind you that even though that may be costly, you'll be blessed more than you could imagine. How many of you have some magi there in your home right now? You have the manger, the, yeah, some of you have some magi. Yeah. I was over at somebody's house and because they were trying to get this scripturally right, they put the magi in the other part of the room, yeah as if they're traveling. Here's what I just want to encourage us to do as we leave. When you see the magi, when you see the wise men, think of how they worshipped. Think of how broadly they worshipped. Think of how you can worship Jesus by just using your life and living your life out with everything that Jesus has given you for his glory. The first step of worship is seeing him for who he really is. King of kings and Lord of lords, the only one that can solve the deep issues of sin that we have. And so it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would continue to work among us to bring us to that point of submission. I'm so thankful for brothers and sisters who are gifted in music, amen, who can come to lead us in singing. Father God, thank you so much for who you are, for your grace to us in making yourself known to us in Jesus. Jesus, you're so big, and and, uh, we see you this time of year in a unique way as a a little baby wrapped in claws and in a manger, and you're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, you're the soon-coming King. So Jesus, I'm praying that you would wrap us up again in the understanding of who you are and what you're worthy of. Lord, that we would be um, driven to see our lives honor you. Every piece of it, every moment of it. Jesus, for your glory. Amen.